Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. It's good to have you all with us today. And as we jump into our lesson, we want to make sure that we have the Holy Spirit with us. So, Scott, would you ask the Spirit to guide us as we study? Sure. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this privilege of meeting together. Thank you for being able to open your word and to study the teachings that you're trying to impress on our hearts. Please let your Holy Spirit speak through us and not we of ourselves. Mm -hmm. Please um, guide and direct our words and our paths. Help us to remember where we came from and um, to keep you first in, in our lives. In your name we pray, amen. 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 So the, our, our lesson today is remember, do not forget. Um, and our memory text is from Deuteronomy 9, 7. And it says, Remember, do not forget how you provoked the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness from the day that you departed from the land of Egypt until you came to this place. You have been, a re been rebellious against the Lord. So this memory text is one of those commands. Don't forget, <laughs> you've been a bad child. Don't forget that. But I want to bring it to today, to one of my favorite texts about remembering. And this comes from the great controversy. And here's what Ellen White has to say on the sub subject of remembering. We have nothing to fear for the future except what we shall forget. As she says it, forget the way the Lord has led us and his teachings in our past history. So we have a, a future to remember that from our past that we don't have nothing to fear. We are now a strong people if we will put our trust in the Lord for we are handling the mighty truths of the word of God. We have everything to be thankful for. If we walk in the light as it shines upon us from the living oracles of God, we shall have large responsibilities corresponding to the great light God has given us. We have many duties to perform because we have made the depositories of sacred truth to be given to the world in all its beauty and glory. We are debtors to God to use every advantage he has entrusted to us to beautify the truth of holiness of character and to send the message of warning and comfort of hope and love to all who are in the darkness of sin. So we have a future as long as we <coughs> remember we have nothing to fear from the past because whatever has happened, God will lead us. So I want to look at these two words, remember and forget. We see these words throughout the Bible. Both of them refer to something human, something that happens in our minds. Both verbs are, <clears throat> are, they, are, are, and they're opposite. Both are verbs and they are opposites. To remember is not to forget, and to forget is not to remember. In Deuteronomy, we see the word used there as zakar, Z-A-K-A-R, which means to signify or remember and it's used 15 times. It points to maintaining in our memory God's acts of kindness, of love and care, his goodness toward his people and his leadership, which is very comforting, I think. We also see the word shakak, S-H-A-K-A-K-H, meaning forget. We see this four times in Deuteronomy. Israel's forgetfulness to God and what is the right is a dominant feature during their journey to Egypt. So, and that's, we, we see, we've seen that in our memory verse. So a third word that is key to this study is the Hebrew verb shema, S-H-A-M-A. It has two complements, meaning first to hear or listen and then to obey. This word occurs 91 times. I can't believe that. 91 times. Six times um, it's actually used as a command. 
So we're to listen or to hear. A closely related word is shamar, S-H-A-M-A-R, and it's used 73 times. It means to keep or observe. <coughs> so we see this listen and obey and keep and observe. For these statistics, it is evident that Moses underscores obedience to God and his word. When we know God and appreciate his acts of love on our behalf, it only makes sense that we will then follow his instructions with joy out of gratitude for his goodness to us. So God often tells his people to remember all things that he has done for them, to remember his grace, his goodness. So much of the Old Testament consisted of the prophets telling the people not to forget what the Lord had done for them, but also, most important, they were not to forget what their calling was for him and what kind of people they were in response to that calling. In Psalm 77, 11, we see, I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. And so we see this over and over and over, and especially in Deuteronomy so have you ever thought about what life would be with like without memory? And we see those today, many today, have issues with their memory. And we see that especially in Alzheimer's patients. <clears throat> so when we look at the term memory, it's defined as the ability to remember events and experiences. So I want to look at 10 crucial consequences of what would happen, what happens when we lose our memory. First of all, there's no history or understanding of the past. When we don't remember, we have no, no understanding. Also, we can't learn, number two, we can't learn lessons from history. So whatever has happened to us in the past, and it's immediately forgotten or not remembered, we don't remember what it's like to touch a hot stove. We don't remember what it's like to receive a hug. We don't remember any of those kinds of things. Without memories, there's no understanding of the present. The present helps us, <clears throat> the, the memories of the past help us understand our present time. There's no future because we have no perspective of what the future could even look like. We can't even imagine that. There is no hope. That's number five. It's like walking through a dark tunnel. Then, of course, number six is there's no gratitude. We don't recall love. We don't recall kindness. Um, there is no obedience. As we're not able to discern, we cannot retain our identities. There can be no meaningful relationships. Without memories, there is no faith. Because, as Romans 10:17 says, faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of God. So it's remembering that that grows our faith. So without our memories, it's hard to have a productive and functional life. So this week, expressed in Deuteronomy, we'll look at this important principle, that of remembering and not forgetting God's interaction in our lives. During this week's lessons, we'll meditate on this motif in regard to four key events. First is creation from nothing. Second is the deliverance from the flood. Three, the exodus of Israel from Egypt and from its own stubbornness. And four, the conversion of the Gentiles from paganism. All these events have something in common. They will signify God's act of salvation from darkness to light, from death to life, and from wicked to righteousness. So let's jump into Sunday. remembering the Sunday. Yeah, remembering the rainbow. Danielle, you're yes. going to talk to us about that. Thank you. I really love the summary you did at the end because <coughs> remember, it's just such a key of who we are as, as human beings. Without that, it's like relationships disappear. Everything that's meaningful disappears. Um, but Sunday's lesson, remembering the rainbow. And you can say it's like rainbows. Um, just such a beautiful thing. It's... Mm. 
you can't help but to remember a rainbow. As you look for it, whenever it's raining, we always look for it and want to take pictures and show our family and friends and so on and so forth. So remembering the rainbow, it's in a way a little bit of a detour. When we are looking, we've been studying the entire uh, quarter, the book of Deuteronomy, and the book of Deuteronomy is really uh, Moses preparing the Israelites before entering Canaan, and he's preparing them doing a remembering lesson. Literally, so we've been doing that the entire quarter. So it, interesting that we're finally defining it as remember so late in the quarter. Um, but in Sunday's lesson, we're taking a little bit of a detour because we're looking at the flood, which is not in Deuteronomy. But before we get there, the word remember, zakar, appears 210 times in the Bible. It's a good amount of times. But in the book of Deuteronomy, it's 19 times, and for good reason. We've just identified that it's a book of remembrance as he's preparing them. But on Sunday, we're looking as a detour in Genesis and the, at the time of the flood. So the first text we're going to look at, I'd like to look at, before we go there, we're going to look at Deuteronomy verse, uh, chapter 8, verse 2. And in Deuteronomy ch uh, ver chapter 8, verse 2, it says, And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So that's really what we're covering overall in the lesson. But today we're looking at Genesis 8, 1. And let's look together at Genesis 8, 1. It says, Then God remembered Noah, and every living thing, and all the animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters subsided. So here, we're not looking at human beings remembering, we're looking at God. It says, God remembered Noah, and every living thing. Um, and God, now this is exactly at, it's happening exactly at the height of the flood. This text is after the flood has occurred, and is the turning point when the flood stops, and the rain stops, and God begins to reverse, regress the effects of the flood. And interestingly enough, um, it happens to be in the whole flood event, verse by verse, it happens to be a chiastic structure, which we've been hearing a lot <laughs> lately at church about and learning. Um, that usually the top of a chiastic structure, so if we have it on the screen, I'm hoping that they can put it on the screen. Um, at the top of the chiastic structure, or you can see where God remembered in Genesis 8.1, in the very center, that is like a pointing arrow of huge importance. So when you're looking how it's built up, it starts with the seven days of God's waiting. So this is before he, God's preparing them and telling them how he's going to wait seven days in verse seven, Genesis 7-4. Seven, and then he, after the door is closed, he actually does the waiting of seven days. Uh, and it's highlighted in Genesis 7-10. And then the 40 days of water is increasing, Genesis 7-17. Seven, and then 150 days of water prevailing. Um, Genesis 7:24, and the top of the structure before we start descending down, God remembered Genesis 8:1. So this is of huge importance. It's the center, and you can see the descending now. 150 days of water decreasing, 40 days of water continuing to decrease. They're all highlighted in different texts. Seven days of Noah's waiting, Genesis 8:10, and another seven days of Noah's waiting before exiting the ark, Genesis 8:12. Now, and then God remembered. The, the verse, this verse at the tip of the structure does not imply that God had forgotten Noah for a time. Instead, it's an expression indicating God's um, grace. A touching indication of the tenderness of God toward his creatures is found in that statement. And it, it's not just towards Noah, but to all towards all living creatures. He who proclaimed that although five sparrows are sold for two farthings and not one of them is forgotten before God, which is in Luke, the text that we're familiar with, will remember his faithful children who are of more value 
than many sparrows. And that's exactly what God did and he's highlighting in this text. That's amazing to see God's grace at work and he is pointing it out so that we would never miss it. I mean, he, he would not forget, but we might forget in our distress. And con so that's very important. That's really what we were looking so far at. But let's continue looking at Genesis, which is part of our lesson today when we're looking at the text highlighted in the lesson today is Genesis chapter 9 verses 8 through 17, but I would like to start reading from verse 10 on. Mm, maybe we'll do it from the beginning. Do I have all of them? Mm. Okay, 9, 8 through 17. Then God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, As for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you, with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle and every beast of the earth with you, and all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth. Thus I establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud. And it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember. We get the same theme again, God remembering. My covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud and I will look on it to remember. Again, the same theme. To remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. So we see here, God is saying that he's going to remember, but really, when I'm reading this word remember, I hear the word promise. It's really a promise. God is making this promise to us and is giving us a sign of his promise. So it's really beautiful to really see it. Um, I have a couple of other things that I wanted to highlight. It's like this, this rainbow is an evidence to us, to me, Daniel, and to everyone else on this earth that believes in God, that the rain will bring blessing and not universal destruction. But I, as in my studies to this week, as I was preparing this, I found another rainbow. In Revelation 4, 3, so at the end of our book, so if we can look together at this text, John saw in vision a rainbow surrounding the throne of God. Man, uh, so let's look at it. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like a ram emerald. So John sees God sitting on a throne surrounded by a rainbow. And us as men, we look at the rainbow to recall the promise of God, but God himself looks upon it to remember his promise and to us. God does not really re need a reminder. It's rather, it is a sign of his promise to us. It is a present, it's, it's a sign of his unchanging character. Sort of like Jesus' prints on his hands for us as a reminder. It's similar for us, the rainbow as God's promise, unchanging forever. So the, when we look at the entire plan of salvation in its intricate details, it is clear that God has not forgotten us for one moment. There is no chance he would forget us, and he never will. As he remembered Noah and his creation of the, on the flood day, or the days of flood, he has remembered us continually, and he will remember us through eternity. I trust God's heart, and I trust myself in his hands, and I invite you to do the same. Thank you. So that was, we're gonna jump now to Monday. 
So Scott, tell us what the Lord wants us to remember concerning the days that are past. Well, thank you, Barbara. So <coughs> I think one theme to keep in mind about Monday is the idea that God is a hands-on God. Um, he's a nation builder. He's the one who built the nation of Israel. Uh, he, he separated them out of the land of Egypt. So let, let's look a little bit at what the lesson actually says here. So in Deuteronomy 4, we have read the wonderful admonitions that the Lord gave to his people. He had redeemed them out of Egypt by trials, by signs, by wonders, by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, by great terrors, according to all the Lord your God did for you in, the, um, in Egypt before your eyes. In other words, not only did God do something great for you, but he also did it in ways that should help you to remember and never forget what great things he has done for you. So then it says, read Deuteronomy 32 through 39. What was the Lord telling them to remember and why is it so important to remember these things? So let's read that verse, um, the verses from Deuteronomy 4, verses 32 to 39. For ask now concerning the days that are past, which were before you, since the day that God created man on earth, and ask from one end of heaven to the other, whether any great thing like this has happened, or anything like it has been heard. Did any people ever hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire, as you have heard and live? Or did God ever try to go make for himself a nation from the midst of another nation by trials, by signs, by wonders, by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, by the great terrors according to all that the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before his eyes? To you it was shown that you might know that the Lord himself is God. There is none other besides him. Out of heaven he let you hear his voice, that he might instruct you on earth, and he showed you his great fire, as you heard his words out of the midst of the fire. And because he loved your fathers, therefore he chose their descendants after them, and he brought you out of Egypt with his presence, with his mighty power, driving out from before you nations greater and mightier than you, to bring you in, and to give you as their, uh, their land as an inheritance as it is this day. Therefore, know this day and consider it in your heart that the Lord himself is God in heaven above and on earth beneath and there is no other. So one of the things that I was going to also talk about is uh, let, let's contrast this image of God as a nation builder with sort of the beliefs that are held among many other people. So basically all false religions, in my view, fall under a few different categories, which one of them is deism. And the definition of deism is the belief in the existence of a supreme being, specifically of a creator, who does not intervene in the universe. The term is used chiefly of an intellectual movement of the 17th and 18th centuries that accepted the existence of a creator on the basis of reason, but rejected belief in a supernatural deity who interacts with humankind. So the, the question is, how do these plain statements of the Bible that we just read from Deuteronomy um, 32 to 39 um, either agree or disagree with this philosophy of deism? Um, and uh, then I, I might also add that um, the philosophy of deism goes along as well with um, several other, what should I call them, false beliefs. So there's pantheism, which God is in everything and everyone. Polytheism, which you have many gods. Agnosticism, where you don't know if there's a God. And atheism, where you say there is no God. Um, so in this deist ideology, and I'm including all the other ones uh, sort of together with deism, is it's attractive to the earthly or carnal heart 
because it does not require any sacrifice of your sin, your favorite sin or pet theory. It looks to God as an impersonal force that set everything in motion but does not concern himself with the particulars. Um, so all these beliefs have in common that God is not uh, the one specifically controlling the events, but rather he just set them in motion and now they just happen um, on their own. So, and the other part that would be common to these, all these other false beliefs is that morality is divined either by society or by the individual rather than um, it is given, handed down from God himself. So, I also wanted to look at this lesson as a um, type of the, so coming out of Egypt, God was taking the people of Israel and building a nation. So that's the type. And when it meets the, the anti-type would be God taking his people from the earth and bringing them to the heavenly Canaan, which will be the, the new Jerusalem when he brings that, and then it will populate the entire earth. So let's continue here, see what else it says. Moses points the people back through all history, even to the creation itself, and asks rhetorically if anything in all history had ever been done as was done for them. In fact, he tells them to ask, that is, to study for themselves and see if anything such as what they experienced had ever happened before. By asking them a few questions, Moses was trying to get them to realize for themselves what the Lord had done for them and thus ultimately how grateful and thankful to him they should be for his mighty acts in their lives. Central to these acts was the deliverance from Egypt and then perhaps in some ways even more astounding God speaks to them at Sinai which allowed them to hear his words out of the midst of the fire. So, I think in, in this uh, regard, we're supposed to remember that God is so powerful that he's able to speak from the midst of the fire. And then, in, um, let's read the conclusion from Deuteronomy 440, which says, You shall therefore keep his statutes, his commandments, which I command you today, that it may go well with you and with your children after you, and that you may prolong your days in the land which your God is giving to you for all time. So it's also interesting that in this process of nation building, God used um, his special powers to um, prove to the Egyptians that their gods were, were really not true gods. So he showed dominance over every god. So in each plague he attacked a different Egyptian god. For instance, uh, the Nile was considered a god, so God turned it into blood. Um, the um, sun was considered a, a god, so he turned it to darkness. And even Pharaoh himself was considered a god, so he uh, he humbled Pharaoh and then ultimately he ended up at the bottom of the Red Sea. So the point is let's, let's choose God, let's choose to obey him, then we can live and be part of that nation that God will establish. Thank you. Now we're going to move on to Wednesday's lesson, which is take heed. Now, <clears throat> when I think of take heed, we see it uh, defined in the dictionary as pay attention. And so when we take heed, what we're really doing is paying attention. Let's look at Deuteronomy 4.9 and 4.23. It says, Only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. And teach them to your children and grandchildren. So we're seeing two two main themes in, in, the, in this text. Take heed and teach. And we're going to build on those, those also. Then verse 23 says, Take heed to yourselves, lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you. And make yourselves a carved image in any form of anything which the Lord your God has forbidden you. So these two verbs dominate 
<clears throat> the opening of both of these verses, take heed and forget. What the Lord is saying to them is take heed so that you don't forget. So pay attention so you don't forget. And, and the, he doesn't want us to forget what the Lord has done for them and the covenant that he has made with them. So the verb take heed, which is used in, differently in Deuteronomy 4.9, is translated keep yourself. So we're, as we look at this, take heed, pay attention, keep yourself, to, is to retain one possession of power over self. So we're supposed to have, take the power over, our, over self. This occurs all through the Old Testament. We see it used as keep, watch, preserve, and to guard. Interestingly enough, the first time it appears in Scripture is even before sin, when the Lord told Adam to keep the garden that he had given him. So let's take a look at that verse in Genesis 2.15. Then the Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. God is telling him basically to take care of or preserve it. So when God's talking to these people about remembering to these people, us people, and the children of Israel, he wants us to take care of our relationship with him and preserve it. Now, though the Lord tells the people, each one individually, to guard themselves lest they forget, this is not so to forget like in memory loss, but it's more a forget as growing lax and just letting things go and forgetting their covenant obligations. <clears throat> so that they are mindful about who they are and what that meant in terms of how they were to live before God, before other Hebrews, before strangers among them, and before the nations around them. So we're going to look too at Deuteronomy 6, 7, and Deuteronomy eleven nineteen because when we talked about Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 4.9, we talked about taking heed and teaching. And Deuteronomy 6.7 says, You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in the house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you stand up. And 11.19 says, You shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit in the house, when you walk by the way. So we see this basically repeated. And it's interesting that he would say teach because Moses is telling them to teach their children and grandchildren as time goes by from generation to generation of oral tradition that nothing left, be left out or forgotten. That is why teaching is so important. Children were taught also to memorize and often they, were, they memorized the law and other part, other. Um, pieces of scripture. They were taught practical application as to how to live a godly life every morning and evening and times of communion during the day. Not only did their children heed or hear about the, these things, but also perhaps even more important by telling and retelling the stories of what God had done for them, the people would not forget what the house or forget what those things were. Hence, what better way to preserve knowledge of what the Lord has done for his chosen people? And so how much more today do we need to teach our children? I can tell you from experience, and I can tell you from this group, that when we, and we've talked about it many times, when we teach the lesson, we learn it much better than if we're participants in the audience. Because to teach it, you have to, you have to know it yourself. So Adventist Home has... Um, some, some, quite a bit to say on this teaching uh, concept. So at home, parents should be precept and example. They should teach their children to love and fear the Lord, teach them to be intelligent, social, affectionate, cultivate habits of industry, economy, and self-denial. By giving children love, sympathy, and encouragement at home, parents may provide for them 
safe and welcome retreat from many of the world's temptations. And I know that the, that's what um, was going on with the children of Israel as well. To be diligent, faithful, and instruction in the home is the best preparation that children can receive for school life. We have Bible rules for guidance of all, both parents and children, and a high and holy standard from which there can be no swerving. God's injunctions must be paramount. Let the father and the mother of the family spread out God's word before him and search their hearts and ask sincerely, what hath God said? Teach your children to love truth because it is truth and because they are to be sanctified through truth and fitted to stand in the grand review that shall ere long determine whether they are qualified to enter into the higher work and become members of the royal family. So as we see how important this is piece of teaching as well as remembering, because when you're teaching, you're recalling and you're re sending everything that um, you remember. So <clears throat> also I would like to add a third uh, concept and that is sharing our faith with others. Not only teaching your children, but uh, sharing your faith with others always also helps you remember. And um, it not only helps determine what we need, but it also strengthens our faith in Christ and his word. And I think about how that faith is grown when I think of 11, Revelation 12:11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives unto death. So that testimony, that remembering is so important. When our life is full of studying, teaching, and sharing, we have little time to forget. So we're moving right along. <clears throat> yes, we're going to move on to Wednesday. Wednesday. Eaten and full. Eaten and full, translate, I'm translating that. Okay. Forgetting, in need of nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so th that's really the concept that we're trying to um, pull out from the verses on Wednesday. Eaten and full is basically talking about the fact that whenever we are not in need, when we're doing very well, it's easy for us to forget. And the... I'd like to start first with Deuteronomy 6, chapter 6, verses 10 to 12, where Moses is uh, doing this warning, sort of succinct here in this verse compared to the one we're studying today. So in verses six, in chapter 6, verse 10 to 12, he says, So it shall be when the Lord your God brings you into the land of which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities which you did not build, houses full of all good things which you did not fill, hewn out wells which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant. When you have eaten and are full, then beware, lest you forget that the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. So he's basically telling them, you're going to be going to the land of Canaan. The previous occupants were the ones that built the houses and uh, tilled the land and prepared it all, and you're just getting it all ready for you to take advantage of and enjoy. But beware, or you're going to forget. Even as you're doing so well, you'll forget who really is the source that brought you to this land and brought you from where you were a slave. I mean, what a stark contrast from where they're coming from uh, in Egypt, where they didn't have almost anything of, of their own, and they had to work uh, under such cruel circumstances. Um, their lives weren't their own, and now all of a sudden they are in charge, large in charge, and everything is theirs. Um, and this is the warning before entering. But Moses doesn't stop at that, and uh, he goes on and really, really drills into them this, this point. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 10 to 17, and he starts by saying, when you have eaten, in other words, you've already experienced, by the time you've experienced all of these goodness, uh, and you are eaten and are full, then what are you sh supposed to do? You're supposed, supposed to bless. You shall bless the Lord your God for the good 
land which he has given you. Gratitude should be expressed as well as felt. And you know, when we're looking at the, the Bible, God gave them an example of how to express gratitude when you're reading the Psalms. It's like they're full of gratitude towards God. So many of our texts in the Bible. Beware, continuing in verse 11, beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his judgments, and his statutes, which I command you today. So how do we remember the Lord keeping his commandments? We have to be aware of slacking because if we, it's almost like it's a help for us to remember the Lord keeping his commandments, his judgments, and his statues, statues. Lest, when you have eaten and are full and have built houses and dwelt in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold are multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, when your heart is lifted up. Whose heart was lifted up when he was doing very well? Satan, when he was on the right side of God, he wanted to be he, he got very proud and he decided that he was just as good as God. And we know about the Israelites uh, as we've studied the books of history in the Bible is that they did a similar thing where eventually they just thought that uh, they were better than all the surrounding nations and all other peoples of the earth and that God couldn't possibly dispose of them even no matter what they did. Uh, and you forget, so when your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, again he's repeating that to them, who led you through that great and terrible wilderness in which were fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty land where there was no water, who brought water for you out of the flint rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and that he might test you to do you good in the end, that then you say in your heart, my power and my might, my hand have gained me this wealth. So after God went through all of that to, to test you and prepare you, and you might still forget, and you might think that you've done it all through the power of your hand. And we're under the same, um, the same potential threat as them when, when we are doing well to forget. Um, but how do we remember? What's the practical way to remember? Matthew 6.33 In everything we do, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So we are not to concern you know, ourselves with the multiplying flocks. We are not to search and try to increase our multiplying flocks. We should really follow the word's instructions in Matthew where it says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Otherwise, Re Revelation 3.17 is also a warning for us in this time, the Israelite of today. Uh, it says, because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. This is to Laodicea, which is in history representing the church of today. So we're not very much different from the Israelites. We have the same warning. It is the warning to us. Psalm 103, 2, I'd like to close with that. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. That's the encouragement for us, that we are to bless the Lord, praise the Lord, and not forget his benefits. Thank you. <clears throat> that is so important to remember God, what God does for us. That's gratitude. Okay, remember when you, that you were a slave. Thank you. So, so I think the Israelites forgot that a, a few times. They, they did, and in fact, we're going to talk about that. So the, the phrase, remember that you were a slave, to me, I think God is reminding us to stay humble. Uh, and that pride is really the enemy of righteousness and it will lead to slavery both in a physical sense and in a spiritual sense. So during the long time that the Israelites had spent in Egypt, which was 400 years, um, a lot of the teachings that God had taught Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they were lost track of and the people um, stopped following God's rules. And as a result, 
they became slaves in the land of Egypt. So then God had to use his mighty power to pull them out. So with that, let's look at some of these verses because he uses this term, remember you are a slave. He uses it a lot of different times in Deuteronomy. So we're going to review some of these verses. So in Deuteronomy 5.15 he said, And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, and therefore the Lord commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. So I just also wanted to point out as we talked earlier about Egypt, Egypt is also a symbol of atheism or, or of not believing God. So when um, Pharaoh asked who, I, I don't know, he asked like, who's Jehovah? So he's like, I don't know Jehovah and I'm not going to listen to what he says because he's not my God. So then God chose to let Pharaoh know who he was. Um, not, not a very good thing to ask of God. <laughs> I'm not going to listen so so then God proved to, to Pharaoh who he was. So um, Egypt then is a symbol of sin and also a symbol of um, atheism and not knowing God. So now let's look at some of the other verses. In Deuteronomy 6.12 it says, Then beware, lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. So again, the the concept of bondage is associated with slavery. Uh, and then moving on to Deuteronomy 15.15, 15, You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore I command you this thing today. And uh, one final verse, or actually two verses out of Deuteronomy 16, verses 3 and verse 12. It says, you shall eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, that is, the bread of affliction. For you came out of the land of <coughs> Egypt in haste, that you may remember the day which you came out of the land of Egypt and all the days of your life. And then verse 12, and you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt and you should be careful to observe these statutes. So the question is, did the Jews actually remember that they came from bondage and that that bondage is an illustration of the effect of sin? Well, let's, let's read from The Desire of Ages and see what Ellen White says about that. So here I'm choosing to read from a chapter where Christ declared himself to be the Messiah by reading from the scroll of Isaiah. This is when he was at the synagogue in Nazareth. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. As he closed the roll, he gave it back to the attendant, and the eyes in all the synagogue were fastened upon him. And he bare him witness and wondered at the words of grace which proceeded out of his mouth. Jesus stood before his people, before the people, as a living expositor of the prophe prophecies concerning himself. Explaining these words, he read, he spoke of the Messiah as a reliever of the oppressed, a liberator of the captives, a healer of the afflicted, restoring sight to the blind, and revealing the world uh, to the world the light of truth. His impressive manner and the wonderful import of his words thrilled the hearers with a power they had never felt before. The tide of divine influence broke down every barrier. Like Moses, they beheld the invisible. As their hearts were moved upon by the Holy Spirit, they responded with fervent amens and praises to the Lord. And unfortunately, there's a but. But Jesus announced, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. 
and they were suddenly recalled to think of themselves and the claims of him who had been addressing them. They, that is the Israelites, the children of Abraham, had been represented as in bondage. They had been addressed as prisoners to be delivered from the power of evil, as in darkness and needing the light of truth. Their pride was offended and their fears were roused. The words of Jesus indicated that his work for them was to be altogether different than what they desired. Their deeds might be investigated too closely. Notwithstanding the exactness of their outward ceremonies, they shrank for inspection by those clear, searching eyes. So, this proves in this quote from Ellen White that the children of Israel had indeed forgotten where they came from, that they had come from the house of bondage, and Jesus was returning to earth basically to pull the people out of spiritual uh, bondage this time as, as Moses had previously pulled them out of physical slavery in, in Egypt. And Jesus is also getting ready to come back and pull us out of s spiritual slavery again, which is fastening upon the world. But let, let's go on and read um, a little bit from the lesson here. It says, As we have seen all through the Old Testament, uh, the Lord constantly brought the minds of the people back to the Exodus, their miraculous deliverance by, the God, by God from Egypt. Um, and then I'm going to skip ahead a little bit in the interest of time. Um, what do you mean by the service, you shall say? It is the Passover sacrifice of the Lord who passed over the houses of the children of Egypt when he struck the Egyptians and delivered their household. For the church today, the Passover is a symbol, uh, a symbol of the deliverance that we have been offered in Christ. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. And then I wanted to bring us to Ephesians 2, 8 through 13. So let's read those verses. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. So the, the point of all this is that just as God had brought the people of Israel out of Egypt with a mighty hand, he's also bringing us out of the spiritual slavery with a mighty hand. And that also means that we need to remember that we used to be slaves and therefore don't get too proud of yourself. Um, and so I will read one last concluded, concluding verse here. Um, brought near by his blood. Therefore remember that you once were Gentiles in the flesh who were called by uncircumcision, by what is called circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, that at the time that you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off are brought near by the blood of Christ. So I'll just conclude with that. Thank you. Thanks. Danielle, do you have any other concluding thoughts? Yes, I'd like to, to <coughs> share with you just a few thoughts that have been running through my mind as I was listening to everyone uh, here and as I was reviewing my lessons and preparing. We are in danger as just like the Israelites to, to basically um, get, when, when things are going really well, to just forget. But the Lord in his uh, wisdom has taken us sort of like the Israelites through deserts sometimes, allowed us and safely take us through. Sort of the way that text uh, that we were reading, part of the text was, who fed you in the wilderness with manna which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you, that he might test you to do you good in the end. And while I'm going through those times, and we're going through those times, we have the promises, just like the rainbow, mm -hmm. as a reminder from the Lord that he will never, if not for a moment, and the plan of salvation and so many other reminders and promises that not for a moment will he forget us. He has never forgot us, and he never will, and uh, we will make it safely. It may not seem so at the moment, and... Uh, 
I will keep my eyes on him. Let's keep our eyes on him. <laughs> I agree. And I want to wrap this up <clears throat> with 1 Kings 8.56 because I think this sums up nicely um, everything that we've studied tonight. It says, Be blessed, blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he promised. He, pro he kept his promises. There is not failed one word of all his promise which he promised through his servant Moses. So God didn't <clears throat> fail them at all or let them down on any of his promises. But what is our part then to play in this? God, we know God keeps his promises. What we need a, to remember every day is to ask for the Holy Spirit. To spend time with God and be with him in his spirit. In Acts of the Apostles, there's some excerpts here that I absolutely love. And it's basically that if we're going to receive remembrance and receive power, we need to hunger and thirst for the gift of the Spirit. We need to ask for it. We need to pray for it. We need to talk about it. We need to preach about it. And the Lord, because the Lord is willing to give us all good gifts. He's willing to give all good gifts to his children. And that gift, <clears throat> the greatest gift he can give, is that of the Holy Spirit. And remember, one of the, one of the things, as I say remember, one of the things the Holy Spirit does is bring things to our remembrance. And so, as we're walking through this life, we need that daily baptism of the Spirit and that remembrance of all the good things that God has done in our life and daily give him gratitude for all he's given us. So let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, God, Lord, we're thankful that you have cautioned us to remember, to take heed, to not forget, and to spend our time in your word and in your work, remembering all the good things that you have done for us. Also remembering our failures so that we don't repeat them. And Lord, we're so thankful to know that we have nothing to fear as we go through this life, as we deal daily with the, the, the trials that come before us. We thank you, Lord, that as long as we can remember what you have done for us, the future is bright. So thank you for hearing our prayer today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Happy, Happy Sabbath, Sabbath, everybody. Happy Sabbath.